what is a uh, particular time in the time of the year, Halloween. Uh, it's an interesting time. It's probably one of my least favorite holidays in large part because I don't like fear. I don't like being afraid. I don't like being scared. Um, Lisa kind of brings that up to me a lot of times when we were explaining to our friends the other day that uh, it's, it's not really just that I don't like being afraid. I, I, don't, I don't see the point in kind of paying money to go somewhere and be startled. Uh, I just, I, I hate that. I hate that, that notion of it, the idea of being afraid. But fear really is kind of a part of life, and really it is a part of today, it is a part of Halloween, it's a part of the, uh, the time and the festival of things that are going on all around us. Fear seems to dominate so much about where we are and how we act and how we move in life. And fear is actually a big part of the scripture passage for today. I think a lot of people don't necessarily see it in that way, but it really is if we read the entirety of this story in its context in John chapter 11. Jesus is, is going about his ministry. He has uh, just done this, this healing of a blind man. And a friend of his named Lazarus, who's down in Bethany, is sick and he hears that he's dying. And so Jesus is about to go over uh, and be with him and see him. And his disciples stop and say, Jesus, don't you remember the last time that you were in town? They tried to stone you. And they were trying to talk him out of going. They were trying to tell him that it was safer to just keep on going in the places they were going because the things that Jesus said weren't always welcomed or nicely received. I think in large part because the things that God often tells us are challenging and are hard to receive. But Jesus, in the midst of this, this peril, in the midst of this anguish that he's going through, he realizes that he needs to go. He needs to arrive at the place where Lazarus is, and so he chooses to go to Bethany. And in fact, the decision to go to Bethany was kind of his alone. And he, it, it seems like he embarked on the journey on his own because it really isn't until one of the disciples, ironically doubting Thomas, stands up and says, let us all go with Jesus so that we may die with him there. Thomas is very aware of what's going to happen. He's aware of the situation and the circumstance that he's going into, and he's aware of the situation that Jesus is going into, and he is fully aware of the fear that is surrounding this situation. But he says to the other disciples, let us go with Jesus, and that's where we pick up the story as we read it this morning, that Jesus comes into this city, he comes into this place, and he is filled with fear, the disciples being filled with fear on edge and nervous about what's going on and what's happening. And as he arrives at that place, it says that Martha comes up to him and says to him about Lazarus, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. And it says that Jesus looked out and he saw her and he saw the other people that were there and he saw them weeping and crying and he was moved by that. And we encounter that very short passage, Jesus wept. Some translations say Jesus began to weep. I think it's a phenomenally important passage because at the same time that we begin to think about the nature of who Jesus was and the nature of who Jesus really is, it's very easy for us sometimes to think about Jesus as divine, as Jesus as the Son of God, as Jesus as this person who is going to perform all these wonderful miracles. But we also have to think of Jesus in the context of a human, of somebody who lived and breathed and died. And it's harder sometimes to think about Jesus in this way. And in the church world, in the theology world, we call this Christology. To have a high Christology means that we have a viewpoint of God uh, and the viewpoint of Christ as this very divine being. And then having a low Christology is to believe in Jesus as this human. Some people who don't necessarily follow in the Christian faith tradition would say, oh, he was just a prophet. But the, the, the essence is the same, that Jesus has the ability to live and move and act as a human does. For me, it's a fundamental point of our faith tradition to, to participate and to realize that in large part because for me, it's, it's phenomenal to know that we have a God and we come to worship a God and we learn from a God who has experienced life the way that we experience it. It's one thing to believe that God is this high up being that has these wonderful grandiose ideas but isn't really down in the dirt each and every day. This morning in our Sunday school class, we were going through Genesis and we talked about the story of the creation of Adam. And particularly, it talks about all the other things that were created, lights and day and animals and plants and all of these things. And the creation of all of those things happened because God spoke them into existence. And then you get to the portion about Adam and it says that God scooped down and he took the dirt in the ground and he breathed into it. 
There's something deeply personal and relevant that happens there when we talk about a God who is not this big, large, ontological, big pie in the sky thing, but something that is really personal and deep and correlating with us. From the very beginning of the stories of the Bible, we hear this idea, this notion of how God interacts with us, and that God interacts with humanity in a very deep and personal and meaningful way. And we see that reflected in the story here as Jesus comes up and he sees Lazarus. And, and from everything that we know about this passage, we know that Jesus had some kind of relationship here with Lazarus and Martha and the people that were living there, so much so that, that they that meant a lot to him, that for Lazarus to die, it was a meaningful and powerful thing for him. It was a, a poignant moment in Jesus's ministry. And so Jesus looking out over this people who are here, having had this moment of reflection for himself, uh, he stops and he creates something, something that has not been done before, something that's really only referenced at this one point in his ministry where he brings someone back to life. He creates the idea of the resurrection. So Jesus goes over and he says, roll the tomb away. And you hear these echoes of, of Easter Sunday kind of in the background, the idea of the tomb being rolled open. And Martha stops and says, you know, he's been dead for a few days now. It's really starting to smell. It's really not going to be, I think, what you want it to be. And Jesus says, can't God do all things? So they roll the stone away, and then he calls to Lazarus and says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus, who was bound in all of the cloths, again, echoing things that we would see on Easter Sunday, gets up. He walks out. He's resurrected. It's a really interesting thing, and we said in our prayer of confession, it's hard even for us to look at this because I think each and every one of us have those moments in our lives that we wish that something could be resurrected, that someone could be resurrected. Each and every one of us has probably had somebody that we have loved that has passed on, and we wonder to ourselves, well, could God not do that for everyone? We feel this deep sense of anguish and loss and abandonment in those moments of fear in those moments of loss, in those moments when we've lost people that are around us, and we see this passage. And we have to wrestle with it to try and figure out and understand what is it that it's really trying to say to us. In large part, I think, it has to say to us this beautiful story of a metaphor of how we are to live our lives, of what we are called to. You see, Jesus is starting out in this ministry. He's going around and he's teaching by the countrysides and by the hillsides. And he goes out and he, he hears word of Lazarus. And he hears word that he is going to die or that he is dying. And the disciples stop him from going. And he shows up four days after Lazarus has died. He shows up after it seems like everything is completely over. This isn't five minutes after Lazarus has passed on. It isn't a day after, two days after, three days. It's four days after. I mean, this thing that has happened really is at its ultimate end. When everyone who's sitting around there believes, even this person who does great and wonderful miracles, even this is too far gone for him. It's interesting to me because I think this passage, more so than any other, is particularly poignant for where we have seemingly arrived as a culture and as a people. This week, particularly, it was really hard to try and figure out how I was going to preach on this passage. Everything about where we have arrived and how we have come has seemingly gotten into this place where it seems hopeless. The world, the country, the place in which we live seems and feels this utter sense of abandonment and hopelessness. And then, in light of the news that came out yesterday of the shooting in the synagogue, I once again had to go back and look at rewriting. What is it that God is trying to say to us? And I think that it's no mistake that we've come to this passage this morning. I think that it's no coincidence that Jesus is enacting in this way, in large part because of what we have seen and what we have witnessed. The reality, I think, for each and every one of us, regardless of where we stand, is that there are things in each and every one of our lives that need to be put to an end. There are things in each and every one of our lives that somehow need to be passed away. There are some things that need to be resurrected and revived. And I think that this passage shows and demonstrates to us what some of those things are. You see, there are things in our lives that must be passed on and the things that we must put away. 
And what we saw in light of yesterday is that the things that have separated us, the mentality of, of tribalism and separation, the idea of, of racism, the ideas that we feel like we may be better than other people, need to be put away. And in lieu of those things, something else must be given new life. Something else must be given a beautiful resurrection. And I really genuinely believe that the things that have to be put away and the things that have to come to an end are the things which bring separation and loss and death and anguish. And the things which need to be given new life and resurrection are hope and opportunity. Things that need to be given new life are an ability to look at one another as the beloved children of God. Earlier in Sunday school, we were talking about this idea that when, when Eve was created, Adam sat up and he looked at her and the words that he uttered were, this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. And I said in our Sunday school class, it's particularly poignant for us because I feel like in light, we've lost what some of that is and what some of that looks like. The word that I brought up was uh, namaste, and in, in namaste, as it originally is, is written and created, literally means the light in me sees the light in you. The spark of the divine that is within me sees the spark of the divine that is within you. The flesh and flesh of myself sees the flesh and the flesh of you. The bone and bone of myself also sees the bone in you. It is a recognition that we are all people who are in need of love and forgiveness, and grace, and mercy. And now more than ever, I think that that message is deeply poignant, that that message is seemingly needed to be spoken into us. And for, for some of us, maybe we feel like it's been too far gone. And whether it's the political climate, or whether it's a personal relationship, or whether it's things that you have done, I think that what Jesus was really struggling with when he got there, when he arrived at Lazarus's home, and when he saw that he was dead, and he saw that people were crying and weeping, and it might be a bad interpretation, but for me, I think the thing that Jesus really missed and was weeping over was regret. You see, Jesus heard about Lazarus having begun this passing away. And somewhere in this process, he didn't immediately turn and go. And part of it might have been because of what the disciples had been saying, the idea that, well, if you go to this town, you're going to get stoned, you're going to get killed. And it might have stopped him from moving into the direction that he felt like he was going. And I think each and every one of us experience the same things, that there are things in our lives that God is calling us to let go of. That God is telling us it's time to move on past that. And it might be something you're holding on to from years ago. It might be some way that you look at a certain person. It might be some way that, that, that you act in the world. But what is it that God is telling you? It's time to put that thing to death. And it's time to create a newness of life. It's time to set that old grudge aside and it's time to create a newness of life. It's time to let one thing die and it's time to resurrect something else. I'm a firm believer in the sense that in this entire process, this idea of resurrection, the idea of something and someone being created new again, that it's not created in the same way. I can't help but think that, that the people that were around Lazarus in the days after he was resurrected didn't see the world a different way. They didn't approach things in a different, they approached things in a different way. They saw the newness of life that had been created about them, and in the sense of this newness of life, they saw a beautiful resurrection and something new. And I think that God calls us into that. We see in the story of Jesus and Jesus' own resurrection that the powerful statement of resurrection is that when we put something to an end and we rise something up in newness of life, that it is forever changed, that we are forever changed. And each and every one of us has something in our lives that we have to put away. Whether it is bitterness or anger or racism or hostility of whatever that is, whatever the thing that we've been holding on to for so long needs to be set aside so that new life is able to spring forth. What is that thing that God is calling you to put aside today? What is the thing this week that God is telling you it's time to put it away? Because I think that God looks down in the midst of our world, in the midst of everything that we do and say and are, and God weeps. I genuinely believe that. That there are things in our lives that we hold on to constantly. Maybe it's personal addictions, or maybe it's something even greater for you. But as God looks in the midst of that, he sees and weeps the way that Jesus wept. Because he knows what newness of life could look like. 
We are living in a time and a day, and particularly where it seems like we need more hope for the future. It seems like we need a greater sense of optimism. It seems like we need to arrive at a place where we can stop and look at our own lives and the lives of all those around us and say, we can be better than this. We can be better than the dissension which continues to divide and bring chaos and death. We can be the sons and daughters of God. We can be those who see each other as flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. We can be a people who rise up in the midst, a voice crying out in the wilderness, a a light shining as a beacon on a hill. These concepts that we've talked about that are rooted in a deep faith tradition, that this place, that the church, that the community of Jesus Christ can be the place where we shine for the world, where we declare each and every day that we serve a God of the resurrection, where we can say to each and every person that looks upon us that maybe the world looks like chaos and disorder and maybe in the world you can think about things in terms of black and white and you can think about these ideas of of racism and hatred and you can walk into a synagogue on a Sunday and shoot it up. But here it's different. And what we do is different and what we do in here matters because it must be. God looks into the world that is around us there, and I do genuinely believe that God weeps. But that's the same God who also brings resurrection and new life. That is the same God that when everyone else says, don't you see he's been dead for four days, comes in the midst of it and says, I can create newness here. Whatever's going on in the circumstances of your life, you might think that it is far past and over, but maybe it's time to go back and talk to that person. Maybe it's time to reconcile with that individual. Maybe it's time to try that new venture, that new job, that new idea, the thing that God is bringing to you. Because as many times as you tell yourself, he's been dead four days, there's no coming back from this that we serve a God who says otherwise. That's the beauty of the resurrection. That's the beauty of what we can say and do and preach as a Christian community of faith, that as much as it seems like the world around us is in shambles, we believe in this place in a God that creates and brings newness of life. That's the beautiful thing about this story. Later on this week, in a church tradition, uh, we will participate in, uh, as a community of faith, universal, uh, in, in something that we call All Saints Day. And it's a beautiful recognition of the people that have passed on before us, those that have come and have gone, and we remember them. And I always say in services that we do, or funeral services that we do here, that in the Presbyterian tradition, we don't refer to them as funeral services. We refer to them as a witness to the resurrection. And I genuinely believe that, that something happens in there. Because at our funeral services, I I genuinely, regularly try to encourage people to say, speak stories of this person that you have seen and speak the laughter and the joy and the tears and the sorrow and the sadness and everything that you've experienced with them because in sharing those stories, we allow for them to continue to live. We are a community of faith that gathers here to share the stories of Christ. We read these stories, these things which shape and form and guide and direct and provide for us a newness of life because we believe that this is a God of resurrection, that this is a God who has a possibility to create and sustain and establish a new life for each and every one of us. May this be that place. May you be those people, the Christians who walk out in the communities all around us, showing that there is hope for tomorrow, that as bleak as things might seem and look, that there is a resurrection and there is a newness of life made possible through God. To him be all honor, glory, dominion, and power now and forever. Amen.